This episode of The Dog Show features Daniel Shuliff. Daniel is the CEO and founder of Keto Natural Pet Foods. Keto Natural offers a super low-carb kibble called Ketona. It has 90% fewer carbs than other premium kibbles and more animal protein per serving than most raw diets. Daniel is also the author of Dogs, Dog Food and Dogma, The Silent Epidemic Killing America's Dogs and The New Science That Could Save Your Best Friend's Life. In the interview, we discuss keto diets for dogs, including the benefits of ketogenic diets, how they compare to other foods, and whether or not it is hard to transition your dog onto a keto diet. Daniel, welcome to The Dog Show today. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. As we just mentioned before we jumped on the show, we're on different sides of the world, but the knowledge you've got in the space of dog food um, and I guess generally dog, like the science around that is going to be hugely beneficial to our audience. So I'm excited to have a chat to you today. Yeah, that's right. A lot of like uh, the work that I do pertains to the regulatory framework that we use here in the United States around the sale of pet food, which is in some ways derived from that science. And I unfortunately can't speak well to the Australian labeling and other kind of like legal regime. But um, other than that, I think all this stuff that I'm that I can be helpful with is uh, just as useful for dog owners in Sydney as it is for dog owners in Salt Lake City. That's good. There's lots of listeners from the United States as well, so I'm sure they can you can talk to that regulation as well. Um, and yeah. outside of regulation as well, I mean, the science of what you're putting into your dog's body is beneficial to anyone anywhere, I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, naturally. Um, <laughs> before we jump into the serious stuff, I want to hear a bit more about your dog. You've got a St. Bernard, I believe. So, yeah, I have three dogs who live in my home with me now. And um, my my partner, my girlfriend, moved in about a year ago. And so we did, uh, are you familiar with the American sitcom, The Brady Bunch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we Brady Bunch together too. You know, she had her dogs and I had mine and uh, they came together. And so at the time we got together, I had, <clears throat> excuse me, large male Rottweiler and an even larger um, male St. Bernard. Mm. And she's got a couple of rescues. She works in animal welfare and does a lot of work with rescue dogs. And she, she's got a kind of couple of dogs of somewhat indeterminate lineage. And um, yeah, we do our best to make a happy household out of it. That's interesting. Yeah, some really big dogs there um, with, I yeah. imagine, different personalities and things as well. How, how has it been meshing like with the, with the household? Yeah, everybody's pretty pretty good like that. There's nobody who's like too much of a problem. One of her two dogs is a, um, it's a Husky mix mm. and she mm. used the, the like genetic tracing company and bark to determine to like, she sent off a sample to them and asked, what's this, how does this dog break down? And they came back and they said that it was 30% wolf. And whether that's true or not, I, you know, I, I can't say. She looks like it. She's got like a very upturned nose and a, like kind of like a slinky demeanor. Like she definitely is not. And but she's sweet. She's like real sweet. All yeah. of our dogs like get along very well. They're all really nice. Um, she's very docile, but she's like not domesticable. <laughs> like she's just like, it, you know, she wants to like she's yeah. always standing at the back door, like ready to go outside. And like when she's outside, she always wants to just be at the furthest edge of everything. And she'll she's just like not the brain is not 100 percent the same as like a, a standard issue house pet. Yeah, sure. yeah. Still got a little yeah. bit of that wild instinct in there. Some of it, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're, you wrote a book called Dogs, Dog Food and Dogma. Sorry, I had to just make sure I said that right. Um, yes. And you talk about there being a silent epidemic killing dogs in the United States. And I'm sure that's probably um, consistent everywhere in the world. But what, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the problem of obesity. Um, okay. When I got my Rottweiler ages ago now, I mean, I started, this is embarrassing to say in some ways, but you know, I started work on the book in 2011. And um, so I was just a young man then, but I had just gotten my Rottweiler a few years before. And um, he, he's gone now, but uh, unlike the dogs that I have now, his personality was very much the kind, you know, like he was an assertive, serious Rottweiler that needed, um, you know, 
daily exercise in order to become like a polite member of society. Mm. And um, I basically, in an effort to try to understand how to do that well, to start looking at the scientific research surrounding those subjects, like the overlap between behavior and exercise and how to exercise efficiently for behavioral issues, I started going down rabbit holes pertaining to like different nutrition, veterinary nutritional science topics. And it's like then that I un came to understand how serious a problem obesity is among pets in the Western world. And um, I was surprised at that point, I take it for granted now, but I was really surprised at that point, both to learn about the prevalence of the condition and the seriousness of it. Um, the, and to speak kind of more in more detail about that, the prevalence is like astounding in the United States. And I'm not really aware of, of I, I would imagine that similar surveys have been done in Australia and on European countries. But in the United States, the prevalence of overweight in dogs, so not like morbid obesity, but overweight is more than 50 percent. So if you pick the next dog you see at random on the street, you are more likely than not to find an overweight dog than you are to find a normal weight or below average weight dog, um, which is obscene to me. Um, and then the second, the, fact, the second fact I always like to make sure I tell folks when I'm trying to give them a sense of the gravity of the obesity situation in the States is surrounding the seriousness of it. There have been, um, there's kind of like one gold standard study that was used to determine the impact of body composition on lifespan and disease in dogs. And it, I guess it was done about 15 years ago now, it's been a while, but they basically, really simple, they took two sets of dogs from the time they were pups and paired them off into two separate groups and then followed them through their entire lifespans, noting different disease outcomes and other kinds of like biomarkers. And really they just fed one group more than the other and made one group like moderately overweight. So not the kind of dog where it is a, a shocking thing to see and the belly's dragging in the dirt and it can't even walk, just like moderately overweight. And the delta, the difference in lifespan between the two groups at the end of the day was massive. It was bigger, you know, dogs unfortunately live very short lives, right? Yeah. Um, as yeah. compared to human beings. Yeah. But on a percentage yeah. basis, the difference is more severe for just being like moderately overweight then the difference between a light, a smoker, a human smoker over an entire lifetime versus a non-smoker over their entire lifetime, um, which is a, you know, obviously a huge deal. You know, when you see, we have, we all have like the gut level reaction. When you see somebody who's a smoker, that is clearly a very unhealthy person. That's a very unhealthy habit. You keep it up over a lifetime and it's going to jeopardize your health in all likelihood. And I, at the time I was like reading all this stuff, it was like, I had never thought, I fancied my, you know, I got a graduate degree. I'm a smart person. I take my dog really seriously. How come I've never heard about something like this that's such a big, it impacts it in such a significant way. Um, and so that stuff kind of blew me away. And then kind of like the, the, the icing on the cake was that it seemed to me that it's the easiest, why shouldn't, it's the easiest thing in the world. You know, the challenges that human beings who are looking, who are, who are, who need to lose weight face, um, just aren't the same ones that, that we face with pets. There's no issue of willpower, mm. right? There's no issue of like being tempted by the, the delicious aromas You're walking by some, you know, fresh baked, whatever. It's just the owner understanding that this is bad and giving the dog, um, you know, it's in full control of what kind of food, the amount of food, all that kind of stuff. And so it just kind of blew me away. And um, I just went deep. <laughs> like I just kind of went deep. And it, the like kind of further I went, the more of a story it seemed to be to me. Um, I originally planned to just use it for my own personal reference. I then grew it into like, this is something that other people might find valuable if they're like me. And this is maybe, a you know, an ebook that I could put out there. Maybe I could start... And it just became, I burn it down and start again with a, like a larger, um, with a with a more serious target in mind each time. And ultimately it's a project that took four years. It's like 400 pages long. And it's, you know, it took me all over the country. I lived with biologists at the Yellowstone Wolf Project, went into all the dog food factories. There's tons of like first person research and it's just a, it's a big project. And um, 
yeah, I hope it's done something to draw attention to, like you said, what I call a silent epidemic. It's just, it's something that's simmering under the surface at all times. And for how much we all care about our pets these days, how much money we're all willing to spend on them, there's very little in the published research that we know will move the needle, make your dog meaningfully healthier. There's very little you can do that can move the needle more than managing its body composition. That's like a surefire, rock solid way to improve the animal's health. Yeah, it's interesting that you compare it with smoking. I don't think it's something that I've ever made the comparison with in terms of obesity and smoking. Um, like, there's obviously that, you know, people have this perception of smoking if it's a bad thing or um, you shouldn't do that. And, that. and that's largely to do with the education people have had around um, the, the ill effects it can have on your health, right? Uh, but, you know, you're comparing that to obesity where people, it's almost more accepted, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think um, I'll tell you, here's an interest. Think of this timeline. It's it's easy for us sitting here in 2021 to say that the public perception around smoking is that it's clearly something that's horrible for health. Mm. But it's also easy. I, I didn't really know this until I started understanding the history of smoking. It took basically three decades from the time that the body of research was well developed enough that the Surgeon General of the United States, that's our top health official, issued a special report on the health impacts of smoking and laid out everything that we know, basically the same things we know today. This causes lung cancer. This will contribute to heart cardiac problems. And that was in the mid 1950s. Smoking, even with that, smoking rates didn't start to decline in earnest until like the mid 1980s. Mm. And yeah. so, you know, now in the world of obesity, canine, you know, pet companion animal obesity, the body of research is not even now as good as it was at the time that the Surgeon General put out the report on the um, ill effects of smoking in, in human beings. And so you can start to get a sense there, are, you know, in addition, there are these like sociological factors that suggest it probably news probably won't spread as quickly. We're dealing with our pets after all, we're not dealing with ourselves. And so, yeah, you start to see how many, you start to do the math and you think about how many dogs there are in the Western world and you start to think, man, there's a lot of them that are going to pay the price for this not becoming a popular enough issue um, quickly enough. Mm. Yeah, so and obviously you mentioned, you know, that controlling obesity or weight management is like such a huge part of, um, I guess, extending your dog's life, which every dog owner in the world, I imagine, would want to do. Uh, but that's like that's the biggest portion outside of you know exercise and things like that i think that the diet is so important and after all the research you've done and all the people that you've spoken to you came to the idea that a ketogenic dog diet is the most beneficial for weight management is that right uh it's close it, it my, my the way that i see the world as expressed in my book is that carbohydrate dietary carbohydrate is the fundamental cause of obesity in dogs and cats as in human beings. Um, that is not uh, what you would consider mainstream veterinary nutrition dogma. The dogma is all calories are created equal. And if your dog is fat, it's because you as a pet owner are either are somehow screwing up. You're either um, not, you're too stupid and you're not aware of the problem of how big a deal it is or you're not self-disciplined and you're giving your dog, every time it wants more food, you're just giving it more and more and you can't control yourself, or you're lazy and you're not giving it enough exercise. Uh, the conclusion I reach in the book is that that is not, that does not hold water for a whole host of different reasons. And that in reality, what the real problem is, is that we're feeding these animals copious quantities of something that they are not evolved to be able to metabolize in any kind of serious quantities and um, there's a seriously robust body of evidence that says this is exactly what makes them fat. And so a ketogenic diet is a term of art, right, that means uh, something different to different people. Um, generally speaking, um, I, maybe I'm telling you things you already know, so by all means stop me, but the most common definition that I hear when I talk to um, lay pet owners is a um, you know, keto diet is essentially a, a diet that is so low in carbohydrate content that it causes the animal's body to produce and metabolize this substrate called ketone bodies. So it's ketogenic, it, genic meaning making, right? It's just ketogenic, it makes ketones. It's in the state of ketosis. Um, it's a little bit of like a, um, 
it's not it's not the most precise term in the world because the the reality as documented well in research is that dogs kind of are producing ketone bodies regardless of what they're eating it's really kind of a matter of degree and so if you want to maximize the degree to which your dog is in a ketotic state, maximize the amount of ketones that it's producing. There are a host of things that you want to do, including, you know, minimize or eliminate carbohydrate intake. Um, but it's a little bit. So, so when you say a keto diet is the best way, to me, it's like basically issue number one is, and I mean it's the alpha and omega of this issue is just like reduce carbohydrate content as much as your budget and your lifestyle will allow and increase protein content up to the point where you're not jeopardizing the dog's fat intake needs. And those two things, I don't know that that's necessarily a maximally ketogenic diet. There are some folks out there um, who believe that maximizing ketosis in either human beings or in dogs is healthful, that in and of itself, it's, it's something you wanna do because it'll do X, Y, and Z. If you're one of those people, obviously you can go beyond just carbohydrate elimination, but for weight loss purposes, eliminate the carbohydrate and you're gonna watch the, like the weight might not, you might not change weight, but you will watch visibly as fat loss occurs. Yeah, so obviously weight, weight management or weight loss related to less carbohydrates is the primary purpose of the keto diet, but what are some of the other benefits that you were leaning towards there? So the way that dogs metabolize carbohydrate is completely different um, from the way that they metabolize other nutritional substrates. So basically, they evolved one of the very few ways um, that do dogs and wolves are very genetically similar, right? I, we, we all know that. But the degree to which they're so similar sometimes surprises people. Like the way that biologists typically describe the dividing line between two species, the most common test or like kind of back of envelope test is like, can members of one species breed with the other? If not, you've got two different species that's, that's you know, a chimpanzee and an orangutan are different. They can't, they won't make babies if they try to breed together. Dogs and wolves are two distinct species, but they're so similar that they can interbreed. In the United wow. States, we have like, likely have more than a million dog-wolf hybrids. I literally have one living in my house um, <laughs> in the United States at any given time. It's a really common thing, which is like as which is to say, basically, they're as similar as two species get. Um, and one of they're kind of um, in just the past ten years, some really interesting research has been done on what makes them different. How, as a matter of genome sequencing, are they similar, and in what ways are they different? Basically, there are two ways that they're different. One is the brain is different. Like there's a dog, it manifests in ways that we're all familiar with. Like a dog is a domesticable house pet and a wolf is a wild animal. And that's something that primarily manifests right in the brain and then in behavior. And then the other is in the degree to which they produce an enzyme that allows them to digest carbohydrate. It's an enzyme called amylase and you make it, I make it too. It's in the saliva and then it's also throughout the digestive tract. And it's like the way um, you know you're making amylase is if you take a piece of bread that's got like ton, you know, it's a composed of flour, right? And you just put it in your mouth for a period of time, you'll notice that the bread will begin to taste sweet. Or you might be like, be able to, oh yeah, yeah, that's the thing that happens. And what's going on there is the salivary amylase, the amylase that you, that's in your spit, is breaking down the carbohydrate molecules into individual molecules of glucose. That's basically how carbohydrate gets digested. You go from these big, what people call complex carbs, long chains of glucose molecules, and eventually you break them down into individual ones, which can then be absorbed into the bloodstream. Wolves can't even do it. So if you, there's a reason that wolves eat 0.0% carbohydrate, and that's because they've never really evolved the ability to digest the stuff at all. Dogs evolved this, like alongside just around primarily the same time they were being domesticated by humans, they picked up this useful adaptation that allows them, like us, to digest carbs down into individual glucose molecules. And if you're living in a um, world of scarcity where you're, you know, you're fighting for each meal, it's a really useful adaptation. You can see exactly why it evolved, particularly alongside human beings who are like developing agriculture. Um, in the modern world, it's um, that doesn't mean that it's like a healthful thing. And so where the rubber hits the road on this is basically when a dog eats a carbohydrate rich mule, 
all the glucose, all that carbohydrate gets turned into individual molecules of sugar, of glucose, and floods the bloodstream as glucose. And that is just not what your dog is equipped to do. And so these metabolic changes take place at that level. The body has to scramble to like get rid of all that blood glucose that never, like that, that kind of thing, a big spike of blood sugar like that never happens. If you're feeding a dog an exclusively meat diet, there's no, there's never a time when it's blood sugar or it's bloodstream is just flooded with glucose. And so it's like all the health implications of that difference are kind of the main reason. That's kind of like the umbrella reason why I believe that people ought not to feed their dogs dietary carbohydrate. So what's the difference then between like a ketogenic diet? Is it is it literally all meats um, compared to like so, a, sorry, yeah, compared to other diets, like a, a raw diet or a freshly cooked diet? Obviously the ingredients that are going in are different, but are there are other differences as well. The, um, I think it's fair to say that some raw diets and some fresh diets are ketogenic. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. some kibble, relatively few kibbles, but like some kibbles can be as well, but not all. And that's sort of a personal bugbear of mine. That's one way in which I believe the regulation of pet food in the United States and, and kind of the marketing and the industry side of it needs to get caught up to the scientific reality. Mm. You know, there are, um, for ages, there was no way to feed a dog. If you wanted to feed it a ketogenic diet 15, 20 years ago, the only thing you, you could you had to choose, it wasn't necessarily going to be every raw diet or every fresh diet, but you had to choose that. Nobody could make kibble that was low enough in carbohydrate content to do those things. Um, that's not to say that every raw diet or every fresh diet is created equal. You know, I can just as easily feed my dog a diet that's 20% protein that's raw. And unfortunately, there are brands in the United States that kind of do precisely that. As I'm sure you know, a calorie of um, carbohydrate is something like one tenth the cost of a calorie of meat protein on average. And so there's a strong business reason why companies want to use as much carbohydrate as they can get away with for marketing purposes. And so in the United States, our producers don't have to disclose carbohydrate content, which right. is astounding. And it is, by the way, likely to change in the next few years, it's, it seems. But um, to date, if you're like, I really want to reduce my dog's carbohydrate intake, which food product is right for me, you kind of need a calculator to like figure it out. And so a lot of folks say raw equals um, less carbohydrate, therefore I'm going to choose raw. It's not always the case at all. And some of the most popular brands uh, that are kind of like making particular headway these days are doing that because they're selling at raw price points with um, kind of a heavy carbohydrate content. I assume that, and I'm, I've not made kibble before, I really research kibble that much myself, but I'm assuming in the past, at least, a lot of the fillers in kibble would have been carbohydrates, as you mentioned, because they're cheaper and it's easy to produce at scale. So what kind of fillers are going into a, a, a keto style kibble or a meat meat like uh, sorry a, a protein heavy ki kibble which doesn't have a lot of carbohydrates yeah so the the way to think about it what's missing what like the innovation that we had to do is on binding the ingredients together yeah. it's like binding them together like if you've ever or if anyone listening has ever tried to bake if you're drinking the low carb kool-aid that's an American expression. I don't know if that means anything. <laughs> That's fine. I got, I got you. <laughs> if you're like riding on the bandwagon already on low carb and you say, I believe in this, but I'm going to try to eat as many food products as I can to make myself happy. If you ever try to make low carb bread, it's incredibly difficult mm. because when you mix your dough together, if you don't put flour in, when you heat it up, it just wants to fall apart. Mm. It doesn't like at all adhere together. And the reason for that is because that's what the flour does. It's basically it's those same, the way I was describing before how when starch gets broken down by amylase into glucose molecules, something not all that different happens when you heat it up. It gelatinizes. Like those individual molecules of starch basically turn into a gluey substance that holds the rest together. And that's why almost everything that you bake has to either have cornmeal or flour or something to that effect in there to hold it all together. And kibble is essentially just like meaty bread. That's like, that's basically what it is. It's like we mix this dough together. We, you know, in the case of kibble, as opposed to bread, there's a meat component as well. And then it's heated up and sliced into individual little nuggets, like little nuggets of bread. 
And so the same problem that you encounter if you try to make bread without flour is what you encounter if you try to make kibble without carbohydrate. And so we imagine it took us a long time and a lot of money, yeah. but we did figure out a way to square the circle and kind of at a very general level, a way that like I can describe without wor worrying about trade secrets. One is animal products. So there are things from within animals that are sticky and tacky and serve in that binding capacity, particularly the tissue called collagen. Collagen serves in that function. Second is that some types of carbohydrate, particularly indigestible fiber, can serve in some ways as a binder. It's not nearly as good as like flour, but it still does the job to some degree, but it isn't digested by the dog. So this is fiber that basically that passes through, that plays a nutritional role in digestion, but isn't absorbed. It's not actually calories that the dog takes in, right? It's something that, that passes through it. And then the third is that, you know, our, our kibble is not carbohydrate free. There is a small amount of starch in there and it's like just we just that was basically our trial and error process was just trying to reduce that number as much as we could while still making a kibble that's like viable that held together throughout the process so it's kind of those three things one question i've got in my mind when I'm, while you're talking about this is like, are you giving the dog less food in terms of like the mass i guess one one thing that might be hard for owners to transition from a carbohydrate heavy diet to a pure purely meat diet is you might be you know going from something this big to this big and they feel like their dog's not getting enough food so is, is that is that the case well it's less than you think um both protein and dietary carbohydrate contain about four calories of nutrition per gram hmm. and so if what you're doing at a very fundamental level in your formula is you're swapping out the carbohydrate for protein you kind of wind up with about the same amount of product Okay. If on the other hand, what you're doing is you're swapping it out for fat, fat contains more calories per gram than either protein or carbohydrate, more than twice as many. And so if you have a very fat rich food, which some folks who believe there's not a great deal of evidence on this, but some folks who are just like, my number one issue is make my dog as ketotic as possible, will feed a very fat rich diet. They, they don't like necessarily feeding protein. And in those cases, yeah, the, the size gets kind of small. But, you know, as I'm sure you know, like food, uh, different commercial food, dog food products, like they change in caloric content. But, you know, our kibble products aren't like particularly, you don't, it's not like a small serving size, really. Is it hard to transition a dog that isn't used to, you know, a keto style diet, diet onto it? So it's actually uniquely, I, this is not, uh, I know this sounds ridiculous, probably, but it's something that we actively call out when we send folks our first bag is we're like, one way you will know that this is a truly different product than what you are used to is that the transition from a garden variety kibble onto a very low starch food product, whether that's raw or whether it's a low carb kibble, is there is much less of the digestive upset that you typically see alongside transition from like one kibble to another. You know, on the back, at least in the United States, back of virtually every bag of kibble that you can find, there's a transition process described. Hmm. And the re and it, you know, it's something to the effect of like, feed one quarter our food for the first four days and then half and then three quarters and over 14 days you make the complete transition. And they do that in order to reduce the like severity of digestive upset during transition. What's going on there is it's, it, it, like when I heard this, it was like, oh, it's the most intuitive thing in the world, but I just never thought about it well enough before. It's about the starch. It's basically like, um, I don't know if you've ever had anyone on your show that talks about gut microbiome, either in pets or in humans. But because starch is such a like late entrant into the dog's diet, since they've only been like, they just barely learned how to digest the stuff at all. They need like everything they can get in that, in those terms in order to do it well. And so with the gut microbiome, where there are millions of different varieties of, of micro, uh, mi microbials in there at any given time, part of what they do is they, they digest starch. And so they grow accustomed, like if you're on one formula with one type of starch molecule and one type of quantity for a period of time, that stuff, the like microbiome evolves to that. It gets used to that over time and settles out and you're good to go. It can digest the stuff effectively. Um, but if you suddenly swap that and all of a sudden I'm going from like 30 grams of rice to like 40 grams of potato a day, it throws all that stuff haywire and it has to get like reacclimated to get caught up so that it's actively digesting everything and not causing upset. 
when you switch over, if you switch to like an all meat diet or like one of our kibble products, you can switch over. We tell people switch over all at once and you're not going to have a problem. Like we actively tell people to do it because it's not a thing um, because there's just not enough. They don't need it in the first place. That stuff, that aspect of the microbiome can just die off when it's not, when it doesn't have the food that it likes to eat, but it doesn't need to be replaced with anything else. They can digest proteins and fats totally fine just on their own. What is, is there ever, ever an issue with like a, the high fat content with dogs perhaps having sensitivities to that? It's not a common thing that we've experienced. Um, you know, I have folks, there's like veterinary wisdom, that dogs that have experienced, um, that, that dogs can develop pancreatitis from a big ballast of dietary fat all at once. And in those cases, the like mainstream wisdom is make sure you reduce the amount of fat that the dog is taking in and its diet going forward without kind of comment. I mean, I'm not a veterinarian. And so those kind of like disease treatment things I, I won't weigh in on, but I think the more important issue is like our food's not particularly high fat. And so it's not really something that I can, it's like if you switch from blue buffalo to our food or something like that, the fat content is roughly the same. It's really about the difference between protein and carbohydrate. Yeah, I think that's a good point that you make. Like there's a difference between um, food nutrition and the science behind that. And then, you know, a medical issue that might be related right. to food. Yeah. So that could be unique to the dog. To toe the line, to be as candid as I can with you, we have to toe the line all the time in that, you know, in one way that I, the, the regulation, the, the regulations concerning the sale of pet food in the United States make total sense is they affirmatively prohibit producers from making disease related claims unless they go through essentially the same process as you go through when you want to sell a drug. Yep. And so, yeah, I can't say my uh, my kid, my, my, my kibble cures COVID or something like that. That's <laughs> not you can't say that. Um, uh, however, in the case of one specific, and so I'm constantly like people reach out and they say, well, here's my specific story is my dog might have pancreatitis because this, that, and the other thing. And like, what do you recommend? And I kind of have to be like, I can't touch that. Like it's against the law. It's just, you got your vet knows your dog a lot better, but in one place it's, it's going to be a really interesting next like five to 10 years. And we see how this develops. And that's around the issue of diabetes because mm -hmm. diabetes is an issue of broken carbohydrate metabolism. Basically, that's what it is, is like a dog that has diabetes can't break down and deal with the glucose that's coming into its body very well. And that's black letter. Read it in every veterinary nutrition textbook under the sun. Mm -hmm. And yet the vast majority of prescription only diabetic dog foods are like 40 percent digestible carbohydrate. They're basically just like regular dog foods, except they're higher in fiber content, like somewhat higher. And there's a little bit of research that shows that if you give a dog somewhat more indigestible fiber and keep everything else the same, that its blood glucose after eating will be somewhat lower. It won't spike in the same way, which is very difficult for dogs with diabetes to deal with. But the much more intuitive answer is just don't give it the glucose in the first place. If you just take it out of the diet altogether, mm -hmm. the blood sugar after eating goes completely, like it's just, there is no spike afterwards because mm -hmm. there's no like influx of glucose. And so we, our product is very popular among folks whose dogs have diabetes and they inevitably have excellent success. And so when it comes to that issue, I've got, a, I'm like sort of towing a line because I'm describing scientific reality. When I say that like, if you feed our dog, if you feed your dog, my kibble, it's postprandial blood glucose will be lower than if you feed it the Hills diabetes specific formula, period. Like I can't say it treats the disease, but I, I mean, I'm describing science. Those are, those are facts. And it's like, um, so it, I think that'll be an interesting place over the next five years to watch because it's just like undeniable. It's just kind of hasn't become popular knowledge yet. Yeah. I mean, there's a huge trend at the moment with dog owners just thinking more about what is going into their dog's body. Um, so I think it's a hugely kind of important conversation to be having because as you said, even though you can't say this will call this will sorry solve medical issues um basically what what you feed your dog may be causing or may help with medical issues just by removing certain fillers or ingredients that aren't sitting well with that dog so yeah that's right it's like i can definitely say um my pro my my food contains a lot of protein which is good for maintaining and developing skeletal muscle mass that's just a matter of common knowledge it's not a disease treatment thing and in the same way, I can say my food will result in lower postprandial blood glucose, like 100%, because that's just a matter of physiology. Mm. Um, 
and then it's left to the user to make the jump, make the leap to say, is that good for a dog with diabetes or not? And it's just a very intuitive yes answer. It's like that is, if you're motivated to reduce your insulin costs, I don't know how, I mean, how much you want to go into the physiology surrounding uh, diabetes, <laughs> but basically it's like you give, the dog can't make insulin on its own. So you give it exogenous insulin to help it manage the glucose that comes in. And so the less glucose, the less insulin you need. And so if you have lower blood glucose, you have to buy less insulin. It's much healthier for the dog. Yeah, makes sense. Makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> Market science. Yeah. Okay, so we haven't actually spoken much about your brand, but Keto Natural is the name of the brand. Um, yep. And all of this science and research that you're talking about on the show today is gone into the recipe for your food. So can you tell me more about Keto Natural and where people can find out more about the, the brand as well? Yeah, so if you want to, the, the, the place to go is ketonaturalpetfoods.com. Um, it is not available in Australia I, I, yet. I regret to inform any of your um, listeners from that side of the world. Um, that said, I'll give you a little bit of background about it. Basically, I published, I finished the book and published it in the fall of 2016. And like I told you before, one of the main theses of the book is that carbohydrates are very bad for dogs for obesity reasons and other, other reasons. And so... By the time I was finishing it up, I knew like, okay, that's where I'm going to go with my dog. And I knew enough about the marketplace at that point that if you believed that too, if like you were on that level, you, you were persuaded by the book or you just came to that conclusion without having read it, um, you're kind of out of luck because there's really just at that time, as of 2016, you could feed a raw diet of some kind or a home cooked diet of some kind. Or, and in that case, if you did it right, if you found the right product or if you prepared the right food, you could do something with zero carbohydrate. Mm. Or on the other hand, you could feed the lowest carbohydrate kibble you could find. And unfortunately, you know, um, both of those issues, both of those options to me had some drawbacks. It's like kibble, the drawback is that the lowest carbohydrate kibble you could find was still like 30% digestible carbohydrate, the vast majority of the fancy grain-free, all-natural kibbles that are priced to be fancy are 50% carbohydrate. So it's not all that low. Um, on the other hand, if you want to feed a raw or fresh diet, it's a more costly and somewhat more inconvenient process for a lot of people. Um, and the cost then, you know, it's like, it kind of depends what, what your dog situation is, right? If you've got like the cost for a commercially prepared raw diet in the US in most cases, is like four or five times as much per calorie as as fancy kibble. You know, they kind of like the the pack the the like unitization is different. So they don't sell you. You know, I sell 24 pounds of kibble at once, so it lasts most people like two months or whatever. And so if they were to sell that, it would be absurdly expensive. And so they sell it in kind of smaller. But at a per calorie basis, it's like four or five times as much. And so if you've got a very small dog. That's not, it's the difference between, you know, 20 cents a day and a dollar a day. Yeah. But I've got a St. Bernard and a Rottweiler and this wolf dog thing and this other shelter dog. And it's like, I have 300 pounds of dog. And so it's the difference <laughs> when you're talking about four or five X, that's the difference between call it 10 bucks a day, and 50 bucks a day. Hmm. So it's a huge right. difference. And so it's just like a non, you know, I've never fed a raw diet. Not because, I mean, I, I go around telling people all the time in my eyes and all meat commercially prepared, complete and balanced raw diet is the gold standard. If you're good with the inconvenience and you've got the budget for it, that's, I think, the gold standard. Okay. But for some people, it's a non non-starter. So anyway, I always thought, like, if you could make a kibble product that was truly low carb, but that was made in an actual kibble style, that you'd have something. And so that I spent kind of the next 18 months developing that. And um, we were able to square the circle. Yeah. And so we sell directly to consumers. If anybody's interested, it's a subscription program. We figure out exactly how much your dog needs based on information you give us on our website. And we ship it to you whenever you want. Our first, Your first order is 100% money back guarantee. No shipping, return shipping required. So if you buy it, dog doesn't like it, doesn't do the things that we say it's going to do, we'll give you every penny of your money back. You don't have to ship it back. Um, but thereafter, it's set up on a subscription where you just get more. Um, and yeah, I'm incredibly proud of it. I think it's changing a lot of dogs' lives. Um, it's good stuff. And what's the shelf life? I guess it doesn't matter with because you. you said, it's very. You know, the thing, the primary thing that determines shelf life is kind of like the moisture content. Like that's why a dried, whether it's kibble 
or beef jerky or dried bananas, kind of the reason that those can stay for so long is that the vast majority of the moisture content is sucked out of it. And so in that regard, our product is the same as like every other kibble. So it's like an 18 month shelf life. As long as it's in the bag and sealed off, it doesn't develop any kind of like those moisture related problems. Well, that's good to know. It really feels like it's a, a good fit, in, as you said, in the middle there between going all natural and raw, which can be complex and expensive and all those things, but also giving your dog what it needs. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, for me, again, I, I'm biased, of course, and I'm, you know, unique in my perspective. But for me, nutrition is the, by far, the most important issue when choosing a pet food, right? There's like, there are a lot of issues that folks, the shoppers are looking at and thinking about, is this going to be good for my dog, bad for my dog, healthful, unhealthful? And all of them have some degree of a scientific explanation or another. Everybody if no matter what your belief is, on some level, there's something where you say, well, look, the science says this happens if you make this kind of food or not. But at, without going into anything specific, the thing I, that, that's undeniable is this, is that like the body of research surrounding issues of nutrition, protein content, fat content, micronutrients and amino acids, that kind of stuff, like that fills up whole books. Whereas the stuff about like, is does one cooking style change the healthfulness of the product or another it's like it's it's quite inevitably it's quite speculative it's like i still consider it like, like i said an all meat complete and balanced raw diet to be the gold standard because i'm a big believer in the like don't mess with mother nature argument that like if an animal has consumed one thing for 99.9 percent .9 of its evolutionary heritage you'd be smart to give it the close to that as possible if you want to maximize the likelihood that you're doing well by that animal but um, as far as what makes that type of diet, like an all meat diet that a wolf eats, different from a you know a garden variety kibble diet, there are differences in how it's prepared. Of course, kibble is cooked and dried out, whereas a raw diet is not. But the real the, the difference that's got like real big serious like scientific backing is the nutritional content. It's just like how much carbohydrate is in there, what micronutrients are in there and what aren't in there, how much protein is in there and what kind of protein, those kind of things, there's documented stuff that shows that that, that does really different things to the dog's body. And so that's why that, that issue just runs way ahead of the rest for me as a shopper. Well, Daniel, thanks for sharing all of your knowledge today on the show. I've learned a huge amount. I'm sure all the listeners have. For anyone in the United States, they can check out ketonaturalpetfoods.com. I'll share that in the show notes. I believe you're going to help them out with a coupon code as well. Yep. We'll, get, we'll put a, a coupon code in the show notes. That's good for 50% off your first order. So even though your first order is effectively $0, because if you don't like it, I'll just give you all of your money back. <laughs> it's 50% off in, it, in addition to that. But I'll only give you that 50% back. I'm not going to give you, you don't get the full money back. But uh, it sounds yeah, like a pretty good deal. Code in the show notes. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty good deal. And for anyone else that's listening from outside the United States, I'm sure they, I might do some digging to find some other, some other similar products um, and services as well. One thing you can check out is before I created Keto Natural, I was, when I was writing the book, I started kind of like writing blog content, like art, long form article content. Mm. And one thing that I had, like the one piece that I wrote that had way more success than anything else I ever wrote was basically just something where I broke down a bunch of brands by their car, you know, because they don't disclose carbohydrate content. So explain to the reader what the carbohydrate content is, what the price is, what the price per gram. And so you could look at the different foods and evaluate what's good for you. And I just wrote a really newly revised one that touches on a lot of like raw brands and the fresh delivery service brands and the newer kibbles, that kind of thing. And so if, again, it's on ketonaturalpetfoods.com. And so that might be a place for folks who are like, not able or interested in our product can't get it you can look there and there might be like a, a rabbit hole for you to follow for something that's that's available in your neck of the woods definitely that sounds like a really valuable article so share that as well good deal we'll do cool well thanks daniel thanks will i hope you have a good day just as mine is <laughs> drawing to a close thank yeah, you for having me thank you all right take care